There are three sections of Chapter 11 that we're covering part of this semester. I do want to emphasize we're just covering part of them. So we're doing that all during the last week of classes, but it's not three full sections. I created a separate playlist for each section, but we really are just covering a small part of each section. All right, so in 11.1, .1, the part that we're covering is summation notation. Now, the title of the section is Sequences and Series. I've underlined series because that's what has to do with summation notation. I'll define what those are in a moment, but I wanted to just point out, I am encouraging you to read your textbook. I think that's a really important skill for you to be developing as you work through your math career. The part on summation notation is on page 1011. So that's not to discourage you from reading the entire section, but it's not necessary to read the entire section just to cover the material that you're responsible for this semester. So this is the part that you really want to focus on. All right. Now, let's put this in context. Let's get some definitions down. A sequence is just an ordered list. So as an example, I could have the sequence 2, 4, 6, 8. The first number on my list is 2, the second is 4, the third is 6, and the fourth is 8. Okay, so that's a list of four numbers. Now, there's a pattern to those. If I wanted to, if I put an ellipses or a dot, dot, dot here, that would indicate that the pattern's continuing. Then we'd have an infinite sequence consisting of, presumably, the positive even integers. If I don't put that, if I just have a last term, this is a finite sequence, and that's the one I meant to write, so I'm going to just stop at 8. So this would be a sequence or a list consisting of four terms. Okay. Now, a series is a sum. Series is just a fancy way of saying it's a sum of things. The connection between a, sequence, uh, between a series and a sequence is that I'm going to be adding up a list of things. So I could have as my example for a series, I could add up the items on this list or the elements of this sequence. So I could have 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8. So when you're writing a list, things are in order, but you're just connecting them with commas this thing, then that thing, then that thing. When you're looking at a series, you're taking those things, but you're connecting them with plus signs. And that, of course, means that we should do the addition. This series would have a sum of 6 plus 6 plus 8 is 20. Okay. So we're really going to be looking at these sums, the relationship to sequences, which we're not looking at in their own right this semester, it's just that the sequence would be the list of things that I'm adding up when I have a sum. Now, this is a finite sum containing four elements. When I have just a few elements like that, it's no problem for me to just write out each of the individual terms connected with a plus sign. Okay. But in calculus next semester, you're going to have a lot of sums where you're adding up lots of things. You might have a hundred things to add up or a thousand things, or a million things to add up. And at some point, you're going to have a situation where you're adding up lots and lots of things, and you're letting the number of terms that you're adding up go off to infinity. Okay. Now, when I have a lot of terms, it becomes difficult and eventually impossible to write them all down like this. And that's where the summation notation is going to come in. So this symbol is a Greek letter. It's a capital letter sigma. Okay. And it's my sign that says, add these things. So this is the sign that we're going to use for our series, which are just sums. Okay. And what we're going to try to do is write down our series without having to write down each individual term. In order to do that, we're going to need something called our index. Our index is going to be a variable taking on 
integer values. And it's going to tell us where we are, what position we're in, in the list of terms that we're adding up. So it's keeping track of our position in the list of terms we are adding. So when we talked about this list, I said two, that was my first number. So I can say the index there would be one. Four was my second number. So that has an index of two. Six, that's my third number. So that has an index of three. And eight was my fourth number. So it has an index of four. Very often, the initial term in our list will have an index of 1 to correspond with the fact that it's our first term. It will sometimes happen that it's convenient to sort of assume that there's some list out there, but say, but I don't really want to start with the first term. I want to start with the second term, or I want to start with the fifth term, something like that. Okay. That can happen, so I'm going to refer generally to this as the initial index or the initial term that I have. Very often it's going to be one because very often it's very logical to start with the first thing that we have in the list. Okay, now the index is a variable. Very often we'll use for the index the variable i. Now that's a good choice as long as we're working in the real numbers. I don't want to confuse that with i, the imaginary unit, uh, so if I'm working in the complex numbers, I would need to use another letter for the, as the variable for my index. And it doesn't matter what letter we use. So as we work through examples, I'm going to be using different letters for the index. I'm going to start out with I because that's one of the most common choices. J and K, just because they're close to I in the alphabet, are other common choices. M and N end up being common choices. The name of the letter doesn't matter. The important thing is that it's a variable that takes on integer values so that it's keeping track of where we are. The index can't be a fraction because it's not possible for me to be at the second and a half term in my list. Okay, so if I wanted to write this sum using summation notation, notice I'm adding up my first term plus my second term plus my third term plus my fourth term. What I'll often do is write the index below the terms. My habit is to circle the index. That way I don't get confused and think these are the things I'm adding. I'm not doing 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. I'm adding up 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8. But these are my indices. Indices is the plural of index. Okay. So if I want to write this using summation notation, which is also called sigma notation, I would write my sigma. That says that I'm going to be adding things up. And then I'm going to look at what my initial index is. This time I am starting with an initial index of 1. So I'm going to say i equals 1. What I'm going to put here is my initial index. Okay, so I choose a variable to use as the index, and I set it equal to the initial index. And then up here, I'm going to put the final index. I'm going until I hit the fourth term. So that's my final index. And this is saying add up all of the terms, starting at the first term, and going to the fourth term. Okay. But then I want to try to avoid having to write them individually. So what I'm going to hope is that there's a connection between the term and the index, that there's some formula that will allow me to express the terms in terms of the index. And it looks like I can. These are even numbers. Each of these terms is just double the index. 
So I can say my i-th term is 2 times i. My first term is 2 times 1. That's 2. My second term is 2 times 2. That's 4. My third term is 2 times 3. 6. My fourth term is 2 times 4. Okay. So, what we put here is a formula for the ith term. <laughs> so, ith sounds a little bit strange. When i is 2, that just means the second term. When i is 4, that means the fourth term. Okay, so if I were given this problem and I were asked to evaluate it, here's what I would do. <laughs> I'm going to actually just rewrite this by writing out the terms one at a time. Okay, So I'm going to say my index starts at 1. I usually will write down my index, and it ends at 4. So I'm just going to count from my initial index to my final index. Okay, And I put those in circles so that I don't get myself confused and add up those numbers. But then above them, I can write what the terms are. Since the formula for the term is that I just double the index, when the index is 1, 2 times 1 gives me 2. Plus, my second term is 2 times 2, that's 4. Plus, my third term is 2 times 3, gives me 6. Plus, my fourth term is 2 times 4, gives me 8. Okay. So, in this section, we're going to be given sums like this that are written in summation notation. But they're going to be relatively short sums, so that it's not too tedious to write them out one term at a time. And we're just going to practice understanding what this notation means. So we're going to go from this form, using the summation notation, to writing it out as a sum of individual terms. And then don't forget to actually do the math, to actually do the addition. We had said this was 20. So if we were asked to evaluate this sum, we would first of all write it out this way and then do the arithmetic, do the actual division. Alright, let's just try another one. Let's say I had the sum as j goes from 1 to 5 of j squared. Okay. So, I'm using a different variable for my index. Again, the name of the variable doesn't matter. This tells me I'm starting with an index of 1. I'm going to an index of 5. So I'm just going to write out those indices. And then I'm going to calculate my terms. Now the formula is, what I do to get the jth term is take that index j and square it. Okay. So, 1 squared would be 1, plus 2 squared would be 4, plus 3 squared is 9, plus 4 squared is 16, plus 5 squared is 25. So I've translated from the summation notation to writing it out in what we call open form, where it's just a list of things connected with plus signs, so it's a sum of individual terms, and then I can do the addition. Now, I know that order doesn't matter with addition, so I'm sort of noticing that 1 plus 9 is 10, 4 plus 16 is 20, 10 plus 20 is 30, plus 25, that would be 55. Okay. So that's what we're doing in this section, just evaluating some sums that are given to us in this summation notation. You might look at this and say, you know, this is so much easier than this. Why do we need this notation? Well, in this section, we're practicing with sums that it's convenient to write out this way. Where this becomes useful, and what you're going to see in calculus next semester, is when I have sums of lots of terms, this is much, much more efficient than writing things out. And sometimes there are some shortcuts for evaluating sums without having to write them out one term at a time. We'll see a little bit of that actually when we get to 11.2.
Right now, we're just getting comfortable with this notation. 